Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballotpedia, where we take a closer look at the week's top political stories. Ballotpedia connects people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. We're here to give you the facts so you can form your own opinion. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for being with us. Today, we're unpacking the midterms with Ballotpedia's editor-in-chief, Jeff Pelle. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Victoria. Happy post-election day. Happy post-election day. And joining us also is managing editor of the Ballot Measures team, Ryan Byrne. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Yeah, thank you for having me. So how sleep deprived are we all? Would have been less sleep deprived if my kid didn't wake me up a couple hours into my three hours of sleep, but we love her anyway. Yeah, we were definitely up late on the ballot measure side, um, you know, waiting for a number of really interesting elections related to abortion, marijuana, all that stuff we've been talking about all year. I know. I haven't even talked to you guys yet. Everything gets, every election night is like this. He gets so busy. If you've read anything about the election last night, then you, you probably come across some kind of article that says something to the effect of, huh, that didn't go as people expected. So that's probably the simplest way I'd describe it. There were all sorts of different results across the country, depending on what state you were in, what level of office. But you know, it certainly looks like we're, we're headed towards some form of divided government in Congress. Maybe the uh, Republicans will take the Senate. Maybe they won't. It looks like it's most likely heading into a Georgia runoff like we had two years ago. Feels a little deja vu-ish, but we'll be back in Georgia most likely for the runoff on December 6th. And Republicans look likely to have the majority in the U.S. House, but not by as much of a margin as they probably expected or were looking forward to before the election started. So how does this election compare to like our our wave data? Clearly not a wave, but if we wanted to say, oh, this is why it's not a wave, what would we say? Yeah. Well, right now it's looking like it would be one of the tightest margins that a party would have after flipping the the chamber. Uh, typically, we would say a wave is, is 47 to 48 seats based on our 100-year our review of data over the last uh, century of U.S. House elections. And typically, a president's party loses an average of about 29 seats in the first midterm. It's certainly not looking like it'll be there. So not a wave. Right. Yeah. It's also really interesting because Democrats came into the midterms with the narrowest governing margins since 2002. Republicans had a similar margin in 2002. So yeah, I don't want to jump ahead too much. But, and we'll get into this a lot later when we talk about trifectas. But the nation certainly seems like it has moved into corners that don't waver. So in, in the early part of our waves research, if you look at the first half of the 20th century, almost the entirety of Congress changed party control constantly. You would see 50, 60, 70, 80 seat swings on a very regular basis. We just don't really see that anymore. And we'll get into that with trifectas later that it seems pretty consistent that for the most part, a state has a party affiliation, district has a party affiliation, and that's about it. There was one race that kind of caught my eye that obviously might have also caught the nation's eye. That was an outlier to how Republicans performed last night. And that was the Florida governor's race where Ron DeSantis defeated Charlie Chris with 59.5% of the vote. Yeah. So in Florida, Ron DeSantis has won a second term and he he won almost 60% of the vote, which would be the largest percentage of any candidate in the state election. He won in 2018 by just about less than half of a percentage point where he, he didn't eclipse 50% of the vote. So he flipped Miami-Dade County last night, which is the first Republican to do so since Jeb Bush in 2002. That certainly was an outlier in a night where, for the most part, Democrats held serve in most of the other races or flipped two states, in, in particular with Maryland and and Massachusetts. Let's move to state elections, since I know you love covering state legislatures. What did we see happen there last night? Yeah, that's right. So we saw so far three chambers flipped into Democratic Party control. We're not completely done calling races yet, but at least as of now, Michigan, both chambers flipped into from Republican to Democratic control. And in Minnesota, the Senate flipped from Republican to Democratic control. In both cases, that gives Democrats a trifecta in those two states. So what we are left with, if all of the results hold where they currently are now, we would have 41 trifectas nationwide, which would be, gosh, the most pretty much ever. There would only be nine states that actually have some form of divided government. This is a really big difference from when even just 20 years ago, when you had the majority of states were divided in some way. It certainly seems like at the statewide level now, Voters are, they're not looking to split tickets and create divided government anymore. They're pretty consistent. And were there any states that lost trifecta status or seeming to have lost trifecta status? I mean, like in Arizona. There are some states that are undecided. We're sitting here and it's it's noon on Wednesday and, and who knows. But right now, at least, there haven't been any trifectas that were lost. So Michigan and Minnesota were both 
divided government already. Maryland, Massachusetts were also previously divided. So there, those are four states going from divided government into the Democratic trifecta column. Republicans did not presently lose any of their trifectas, although they certainly still could if some of the uncalled races in Arizona change. Any other statewide races we're watching? I know the Supreme Court races in a few states were pretty notable. Yeah, there was a couple of really interesting Supreme Court results in North Carolina. Two seats were up for partisan election and Democrats had a 4-3 majority on the state Supreme Court. Republicans won both of those seats, which flips the majority in their favor. So the state Supreme Courts, those are always very interesting and uh, have gotten a lot more attention this year. So North Carolina Supreme Court flip. State financial officers are a pretty interesting area as well. Those positions have gotten a lot more attention this year as well with the ongoing conversations in the states with ESG and Russia and Ukraine investments and pension funds and just a, it's a set of offices that we've covered since 2012 that frankly, nobody really ever cared about. We always cared about them, but they never really got a whole lot of attention. But this year, there's a, there's some intrigue, which we we found to be kind of fun. And there were 50 state financial officers up for election this year. And, and so far, we've seen at least four of those change party control. Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Wisconsin have seen treasurers and auditors change party control. And there will probably be a couple of more as well. So that's been pretty interesting to see. And all of those uh, elected officials went from the D column to the R column. Really, the the, the theme that I, th- I think really happened last night, at least in, in state and federal elections, is primarily incumbents holding serve in the majority of cases. We haven't really finalized any of our U.S. House numbers yet, but I, I think it's going to come out at the end that the one of the smallest numbers of U.S. House incumbent defeats in, in quite a while. A lot of holding serve, uh, same with the state executive level as well, state legislatures. Any notable yeah. outcomes in attorney general, secretary of state races last night? There are a couple of flips in state attorney general races so far. In Vermont, Democrats picked up the attorney general. And in Iowa, Republicans picked up the attorney generalship there. But across the board, there weren't very many other changes otherwise. Uh, Republicans thought they might pick up the attorney generalship of Minnesota, for instance. Keith Ellison, he looks like he's won there or has won there. In Texas, uh, Beto O'Rourke was hoping to unseat Governor Abbott. He won pretty comfortably. So, you know, really, for the most part, we, we didn't see anything like, say, 1994 or 2010, where there were these big you know, bloodbaths of, of incumbents losing. It's been a, a pretty uh, incumbents reigning kind of year, I think. Shall we move to the most exciting races we were watching last night? That is ballot measures, of course. Ryan, do you want to enter this conversation? Kind of a mixed bag of results for various topics. So I think we should start there. Abortion being the most notable topic that was on the ballot last night. Ryan, what happened with those five ballot measures? Right. Like you said, there were five ballot measures related to abortion. So three of them were kind of new. They proposed state constitutional rights to abortion or or to a similar concept that includes abortion. And all of them passed. Vermont and California, that was kind of the expectation. In Michigan, we were expecting, um, based on some recent polling, for that one to be a bit more contentious. And it was. But 56% uh, voted to pass this constitutional amendment. Now, a little bit further south in Kentucky, they were voting on an amendment that was really similar to the one back in August in Kansas, which says something along the lines of this constitution cannot be interpreted to create a right to abortion. Now, there hasn't been a ruling like that in Kentucky like there was in Kansas, so there there wouldn't have necessarily been an imminent practical change if this did pass. But it was rejected with about 53% of the vote. So not the same margin as, as Kansas, but it followed on the same trajectory with that final result. Yeah, it was slightly tighter. Kansas was 59%. How about marijuana? Another topic that was on the ballot in five states. Right. You know, we've been, marijuana has been a big ballot measure issue really since 2010. People think of 2012 when Washington and Colorado passed it. But in 2010, California was the first big state to vote on it. It rejected it. Of course, California then approved it in 2016. So as those uh, pro-legalization organizations move through various states, which ones have initiative processes, they've sought initiatives and they've been approved in most of the states where like, they have Democratic trifectas or in recent presidential history, they voted for Democratic candidates. A lot of the ones left were more Republican-leaning states in terms of their trifecta status or their presidential votes. So those were the remaining ones, Missouri, South Dakota, as well as North Dakota, Arkansas, and then Maryland. That's a different story. I'll mention Maryland in a second. But of those four central U.S. states, it passed in Missouri with about 53% of the vote, but it was rejected in Arkansas and both of the Dakotas. 
Uh, that's actually interesting in South Dakota because it follows on an initiative from two years ago where voters passed a marijuana legalization and this time they rejected it. The oh, reason wow. it was passed last time and why there isn't currently a law is a court eventually struck it down for violating the state's single subject rule. But this year, the campaign came back. They thought they addressed the single subject rule issue, but then voters actually rejected it. And then moving over to Maryland, Maryland's quite different, right? Because Maryland doesn't necessarily have the same political trends. But in Maryland, the legislature actually put it on the ballot. So it was not a citizen initiative. Legislators put it before voters to kind of give them the decision there for, you know, whatever reason. And in Maryland, as the, the polling indicated, it received around 66% of the vote and was approved. Maryland is the second state to take that approach after New Jersey, where legislators also left it up to voters in 2020. Very interesting. Another measure we grouped into this drug decriminalization topic was Colorado Proposition 122. How did that measure turn out last night? It relates to the decriminalization of psilocybin. Right. As of, as Jeff mentioned earlier, our timestamp, it's about noon here. As of right now, it's not called. Right now, we have it at about 50-50. Uh, it's currently slightly leaning towards the yes vote. And as more ballots are counted, we'll know the result there. But uh, it's definitely going to be a close measure. How long does it usually take in that state? Do we hear like within a couple of days or is it, off? it takes a couple of weeks sometimes, right, to get those last little votes in? Right. I think that's correct. With ballot measures that are close, probably similar to candidate elections, you know, there's there's Various reasons why ballots are still being counted. Um, I don't necessarily know the mail-in ballot process in Colorado, though I know they do almost entirely use mail-in ballots. So it could take some time, and that could change. So it could be a week before we really feel comfortable saying whether that one was, a, one was approved or defeated. It would be the second state behind Oregon, which decriminalized psilocybin in 2020. So it'll be very interesting to see how Colorado responded to that ballot initiative. Right. I think it's one to follow up on because there's been some discussion by activists that. If it's successful in Colorado after it's been successful in Oregon, and by successful, I'm not you know making a judgment of the program. I just mean the ballot initiative passing. You could see some groups that backed marijuana legalization, like New Approach PAC, um, which was involved with Proposition 122, start following that that uh, trend that marijuana took and starting to use the initiative through several states to legalize psychedelics. But we'll have to see, and the Colorado result will probably affect that timeline or motivation. Yeah, for sure. Let's move on to voting related policies. There were six measures related to that that we were watching yesterday. Do you want to touch on a few of the major ones? This is a subject area that I find really fascinating, voters deciding voting policies. So I'll touch on a few. You know, in, in two states, they voted on strengthening or, or just requiring because it's not yet required uh, voter ID. And in Nebraska, voters actually approved an initiative to require photo ID. Uh, previously, Nebraska did not have one. Arizona, that's another too close to call race. Uh, in Arizona, the legislature put in the ballot a question about voter identification requirements for mail-in ballots. And that one is currently has, you know, no has a slight lead. It's 49, 51, but that very much could change as we get more ballots. Looking at some of the others, Connecticut approved a constitutional amendment to allow for an early voting period. It didn't previously have one. Nevada question three. So this is your, your top five ranked choice voting, final five, as some of the proponents call it. This is really similar to the system in Alaska, uh, except in Alaska, the system that was enacted was top four, right? So you have four people running in the prime, or rather, you have a bunch of people running in the primary, and the top four vote getters move on to the general election where then they get ranked by voters. The Nevada system would be similar, except top four, top five in the primaries, then ranked choice voting. That one is likewise still too close to call, but is currently leading with about 52% of the vote. If it is approved, something to note about Nevada is that citizen-initiated constitutional amendments need to be approved twice. So even if voters approve it this year, they'll need to approve it again in 2024 before it can go into effect. I want to mention Michigan Proposal 2. So Michigan Proposal 2 was approved. Uh, it adds several election and voting policies to the Michigan Constitution. The fact that it was going into the Constitution was kind of a big contentious point between supporters and opponents because it added several policies that currently exist in statute, such as the requirement that voters uh, need to present a voter ID, but if they don't have one, they can just sign an affidavit instead. So by putting that into the Constitution, legislators now can't easily change it. What they would need to do instead is pass a new constitutional amendment and get voter approval. And of course, supporters of the amendment wanted to preserve that system. So by putting it in the Constitution, it means that it can't be changed. So that whole point, it can't be changed. That was a, uh, a big point, sticking point between supporters and opponents of this measure. I'm just curious about going back to that ranked choice voting measure. Do you recall... 
the margin of victory in the Alaska 2020 measure, how close it was? It was really close. Hold on a second and I can pull that up. It was not a wide margin in Alaska. There was some litigation here and it went all the way. uh, You know, it was a state lawsuit regarding state law and the state constitution. So it went through the Alaska Supreme Court and the Alaska Supreme Court upheld the ballot measure. But, you know, the vote from voters, there was only a 4,000 vote difference. Yes, one with 50 and a half percent. Uh, no received 49.5%. Ranked choice voting has received mixed results. I'm in Massachusetts, it was also defeated in 2020. Yeah, exactly. It was defeated statewide in Massachusetts. Earlier, it was approved in Maine in 2016. Maine was kind of the one that kind of kickstarted that whole process of the ballot initiative and ranked choice voting. We have a couple more topics to get to. So next up is voting on ballot initiative process changes. So we have several measures that were on the ballot in Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado. How did those fare? Right. So some of those are still too close to call, specifically the ones in Arizona, as we're waiting for more ballots to be tabulated. But let's start with the 60% vote requirements. So both Arkansas and Arizona were voting on these 60% vote requirements. The one in Arkansas was rejected. It would have required a 60% supermajority vote for any citizen-initiated ballot measure. Now, the one in Arizona applies to both citizen-initiated and ones put on the legislature, and it only has to do with measures that approve or increase taxes. And that one's currently leading, but it's 51, 49. It could go, it it could still go either way as more ballots are counted. So another one in Arizona has to do with this concept of severance, which many people may not know about unless you follow ballot measures or other legal policies. So what is severance? So when a ballot measure goes before a court, You know, it could have a bunch of provisions, does a bunch of different things. The court says, this one part is unconstitutional, but this other part is fine. So part of it is struck down, part of it is upheld, right? So what this ballot measure would have done is it would have allowed the legislature to just repeal a voter-approved ballot measure if it contained any provisions ruled unconstitutional by the Arizona Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court if it it goes up the federal path. Voters rejected that one. Only 36% voted yes. The other one we're waiting for in Arizona is to require a single subject rule. Uh, That one's currently ahead with 55%. And the last one's in Colorado. It's a bit different from these other ones. So that one actually just has to do with income taxes, perhaps due to the recent ballot initiatives related to income taxes, including this year. So what this one does, the legislature put it on the ballot, 71% voted in favor of it. It would show how the changes in income tax owed would affect different income levels. Income brackets, yeah. Income brackets, right. Mm-hmm. And it would need to do that on the ballot, in the ballot title. So when voters go to vote, it would kind of give them a range and maybe voters could put themselves somewhere in that range to kind of get an idea of how it would actually affect them and how it would affect other income brackets. The last topic I wanted to touch on was constitutional amendments related to slavery and indentured servitude, which is kind of a surprising thing to be talking about in 2022. There were five ballot measures um, in five different states this year. And surprisingly, one actually was defeated in Louisiana. Right. So the Louisiana one was interesting in that some of its legislative sponsors, just a couple of weeks, months before the election, reversed their position and came out in opposition to it. And that was largely due to how it was worded. Currently, and since the measure was defeated, this language will remain. The Constitution says slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, except in the latter case as punishment for crime. What it would have said if it was approved was slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, period. This paragraph does not apply to the otherwise lawful administration of criminal justice. So opponents came out, including some former legislative sponsors, and made the argument that it's still kind of doing the same thing that it was doing anyway. The words were just changed. So did that stick? Is that why it was rejected? I I don't necessarily know, but that's kind of one of the big differences between this one and the other ones in terms of how campaigns and people reacted to it. How about just notable ballot measures in general, results that you want to talk about? I know for me personally, California Propositions 26 and 27 are interesting races to talk about. Do you want to let our listeners know what happened there? Victoria, do you know offhand how much uh, money was raised between those two measures? As of October 27th, so not including the like late contribution reports that might have been filed since then, it was $462 million between all the campaigns involved in both of those measures, which is the most in California ballot measure history, likely American history as well. We don't necessarily have the data going back for all ballot measures, but just from the facts that we know about California tending to be the most expensive, ballot measures getting more expensive over time, you know, just changes in cost of living, inflation, stuff like that. This pair of initiatives is very likely the most expensive in U.S. history. Voters rejected them. So Proposition 26, only 30% voted yes. Proposition 27, which alone 
probably saw more money uh, than Proposition 26, so it's a little hard to differentiate because a lot of the packs were the same between them. It only received 17% of the vote. So there you go, the most expensive ballot measure conflict in U.S. history, 17% of the vote. So that's really interesting. And I'm sure there's already talks about you know them being back in 2024 and trying again with another sports betting legalization initiative. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't think we included sports betting. So that's what these initiatives would have done was legalize in-person and online or mobile sports betting in California, which is still legal there. Some of our listeners probably don't even realize that's the case. I mean, how many states currently have legalized sports betting? Uh, let me look. I'm pretty sure it's 36. Wow. Yeah. I'll ask another question while we're at it because I'm just curious. What, so if it got 17% of the vote, was the money pretty evenly split or was the money all on the opposed side and, and that's what drove the vote down or was it actually all on the other side? Like which side did the money come in on? Victoria may know this answer offhand. So if you do, feel free to interject. I don't know it offhand, but I do have it in front of me that for, in particular, Proposition 27, support raised $169.3 million for the, for a yes vote and opposition total $249.1 million. So it was a little uneven. Well, that's quite a bit. And that's on, that's on top of the fact that it's more expensive than usual to get ballot measures on the ballot, as we found out from you all's wonderful CPRS cost per required signatures report earlier this year. So yeah, what was that number? Soon. The cost per required signature? So like it was like $12, right? Dollars, right? Like $12 per, right, right. per initiative. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just pulling it up to get the exact accurate number here. It was, <laughs> it was uh, $12.70, $12. $12.70 per signature on average. And you, in California alone, that number was even higher. So in California... It was sixteen dollars and eighteen cents on average, and that's yeah, like fifty percent higher than prior years, right? Like it's it's typically not yeah. even in the double digits. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. it's been increasing over time. There's been nearly a three hundred percent increase in signature drive costs since two thousand sixteen. And to put that in perspective for California, to get California Proposition twenty seven on the ballot, they had to collect at least nine hundred ninety seven thousand signatures, so almost a million signatures at sixteen dollars a signature. And Speaking of that, once we get all the turnout numbers, which I'm going to move us into turnout in a minute, we're going to get to find out if the turnout in this election cycle has an impact on the ballot measure world, because the elections in some of the states from yesterday will impact how many signatures are required for initiatives going forward. And I haven't looked at those numbers yet, but I have a sense that turnout was up relative to the typical midterm cycle. So it it might cause some increases in some states. Ryan, have you looked at that yet? Yeah, we haven't started computing that data, but I think you're right. So the real question is like, how much did it change from 2018? Because from 2014 to 2018, there is a significant change in turnout. 2018 was much higher than 2014, which caused like in California, this very large increase. So not that anyone wants voter turnout to be down necessarily, but if you're a ballot initiative campaign in California, if those numbers are still high, you, an initiated constitutional amendment could very much be passing the 1 million signature requirement after this election. Well, so here I've got the numbers right in front of me. So uh, in, in 2012 and 2016, those presidential elections saw 130 and 136 million turnout, roughly speaking. Then in 2020, we saw that jump to 160. So typically, right, in every election cycle, you see the, the presidential is higher than the midterm dips and you go back up again. It's kind of like a zigzag up and down. 2018, to, like you just said, Ryan, was 118 million turnout, which was the highest midterm turnout in, in quite a long time, pretty much ever. One of the flattest drop-offs from a presidential cycle. Projections for yesterday are 116 million, so pretty much right in line with 2018. Obviously, that you know some states will be higher than others on that, but nationally, it's looking like the midterm turnout was was pretty close to even with 2018. Maybe just the population increase, the number of voter registered voter increase, because it was so close to a million already in California. I'm very much thinking that will be the case next cycle. So we'll see. You know, our team will compute that within the next month as the gubernatorial results are certified. Yeah, we have a lot of analysis now that election night is over. We still have, obviously, our processing results coming in, but a lot of analysis to be done. Do you guys want to touch on what sort of reports we'll be putting out in the next couple of weeks? One that I'm particularly uh, curious about and I always like to do is is the split ticket voting. So every year there are always a handful of statewide races where, you know, for instance, a governor's race and a Senate race in the same state like Georgia, state auditor's race and a governor's race like, say, in Minnesota. And it's always very interesting to look at the split ticket results because then you can really get a sense of, okay, did voters kind of unilaterally across the board stay within a party or did they split? And if they did split, what was the impact of that? So for instance, you know, we know that in in Kansas, Jerry Moran easily won re-election, but 
Governor Kelly, a Democrat, is also going to win re-election. So that tells you that voters in Kansas were very comfortable putting D for governor and R for U.S. Senate. You saw a similar situation in Wisconsin where Governor Evers is going to win re-election and incumbent Senator Johnson looks like he will also win re-election. So again, voters in Wisconsin then are going D for governor and R for, for Senate. So not only are we looking at the situations where the voters split their ticket, but also where did they... Um, sort of preferentially weight one candidate more than another. You know, we're seeing that in Georgia where, you know, even if Herschel Walker wins that election, ultimately, he will have underperformed relative to Governor Kemp, who won re-election relatively easily. There are always a handful of races like that. And, you know, we followed that and, and published something in 2020. And we'll do that again in the coming week or so. How about in ballot measure world, Ryan? Any analysis you're excited about? Oh, I think it's the one we already mentioned, signature changes. That's always really exciting. I'm I'm really curious to learn what future signature requirements are going to be because so many of them are based on gubernatorial votes and turnout. The signature requirements vary from state to state because it's a state process, but maybe it's 10% of the gubernatorial vote or 5%. So yeah, just learning more about turnout and how that will affect it. We do put together kind of a final report at the end of the year for ballots that summarizes all of our data throughout the entire year so people can kind of put things in perspective. We also tend to do a report every year on minimum wage changes because believe it or not, that has often been a ballot measure issue. There are, you know, legislatures do pass bills around that. We only had one this year in Nebraska. That one was interesting because it was a $15 minimum wage. It was in Nebraska. We actually haven't had too many public votes on that. Florida did last cycle and it was approved, but it looks like Nebraska voters also approved a $15 minimum wage initiative. And we'll be compiling all that data on minimum wage, whether it's through the initiative process or through the legislature in December. So that's a great question, Victoria, about interesting other elections that we're, we're seeing decided. And one of them is uh, this growing trend around ballot measures that would change election dates from off cycle years, off cycle meaning, you know, they're in an odd year or maybe they're in spring of even years and moving them to even year elections. This is something that we've seen taking place in, in small cities and big cities. And, you know, it's been a, a topic in state legislatures uh, in the last year or so. A, a big reason for that is, is turnout is always a really major topic of discussion. And Historically, statistics and data is pretty clear on it. There's higher turnout in even year elections. So there's been a movement lately to say, well, okay, if you really want to impact and grow turnout in elections, you know, you could add early voting days, you can have drop boxes, you can change voter registration processes. I mean, there's all sorts of different tools you can try. But really, one of the simplest things to do is just put all elections on an even year date, put them all on that Tuesday, November of an even year, and you'll, you'll see higher turnout than you would on, say, May of an odd year. So there are a number of different initiatives put on the ballot across the country and and Ryan's been following them. And now he's going to tell us all about what happened because honestly, I haven't even asked him yet. So Ryan, what on earth happened? So we're still following up on many of them, but some of the early results are indicating that several in larger jurisdictions were approved. So San Francisco, St. Petersburg, Florida, King County, Washington, interestingly, all with around the same percentage, 70% uh, of voters in those jurisdictions voting to move their elections from various odd year dates. Some are odd year November, some host their uh, municipal elections in the spring, but moving them from odd years to even numbers to specifically coincide with federal or state elections. Living here in Texas, we have odd year elections. And last year, my husband was like, well, we were always going to the polls. We had an election in March. We had an election in May. So I, I'm sure he would appreciate something it would along make those our lines. Life of- easier here at Ballopedia. I think we, we, we cover elections something like 35 weeks out of the year with like 114 different unique election dates when our team is having to prepare for an update uh, articles related to elections. And we are more than happy to do it and enjoy it, but it would certainly be easier and more efficient <laughs> It was all in one day. I mean, it would help our sleep schedules for sure. (laughs) Speaking of sleep, I should probably let you guys go get some sleep. But thank you both for joining me today on our podcast to cover the midterms. It is always fun to talk about the elections with our our listeners and with you wonderful folks, Ryan and Victoria. Likewise. And that's all for this week's episode of On the Ballot. Thanks again to Jeff and Ryan for coming on the show with me today. Make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, if you have any questions, comments, or love for Ballotpedia, feel free to send it to us at on the ballot at ballotpedia.org or on Twitter at Ballotpedia. I'm Victoria Rose and thanks for listening.